Sounds good. All right. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Emily Reisner. I am a PhD student at UCLA. And today I'll be talking a little bit about how I got into science, uh, but also a little bit of um, be talking a little bit about some research I conducted as a Wrigley Fellow in the winter of 2019 titled uh, Rapid Growth Disturbance in Lower Herbivory Pressure Facilitate the Invasion of a Brown Marine Alga into Forests of Giant Kelp. So a little bit about me. I'm originally from Michigan and uh, because I grew up in Michigan, I was fortunate enough to spend a lot of my childhood uh, in and around the Great Lakes and many of the other inland bodies of water in the state. And some of my favorite activities growing up were boogie boarding, surfing, and playing on the beach. And uh, because I spent so much time in these areas, I really developed a deep appreciation for uh, these aquatic ecosystems um, growing up. But as I grew older, I started to notice some uh, drastic changes occurring in these ecosystems that I love so much. The first of which was the invasion of zebra mussels, which are a, a type of freshwater bivalve that's native to uh, Europe and Asia. And it um, invaded the Great Lakes region in the 1980s, but really started to proliferate in the lakes that I was uh, frequenting uh, during my childhood. And the second change uh, that uh, started to occur during my childhood, childhood was the invasion of Eurasian milfoil, which is a freshwater alga that's also native to Europe and Asia and started to proliferate in the Great Lakes region in the, um, in the early 2000s, so during my childhood as well. And both of these invasive species, um, I noticed, were having a severe impact on the native ecosystem. So uh, the zebra mussels um, kind of uh, fouled the uh, the lake floor and made it really hard to walk everywhere, cutting people's feet. Um, and then the mil the Eurasian milfoil uh, started to shade out native um, species of algae and kind of expanded and took over the habitat. So I became really concerned as to why these uh, changes were happening, but also how they could be fixed. So this was kind of my first step towards conservation biology, particularly of aquatic ecosystems. So this motivated me to pursue a marine biology degree from UC Santa Cruz for my undergraduate. And um, because I was previous, previously familiar with only freshwater ecosystems, I wanted to expand my knowledge and delve into the ocean realm. And so um, during my time at UC Santa Cruz, I took classes like kelp forest ecology um, that made me really familiar with the, co the ecosystems along the California coast. I received my scientific diving certification that allowed me to conduct underwater research. I took more uh, uh, focused classes like marine botany where I learned about uh, specifically marine algae in California and um, along the west coast. And then I also had several research inter internships. The most prominent of these was working with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, identifying habitat that was critical for the survival of uh, abalone, which is a type of marine mollusk that is threatened in California, but it occurs along um, the coast of California as well as up into Oregon and Washington. So um, after I really was enjoying what I was doing in undergrad and I knew that I wanted to do it or continue on with that kind of uh, research and um, focus in my uh, as a career, so I decided to take my education a step further and uh, pursue a, um, a PhD from UCLA in ecology and evolutionary biology. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to conduct my dissertation research on, I kept thinking about um, things that really kind of impacted me throughout my life, uh, particularly in the ecology realm. And I kept thinking about these invasive species in the Great Lakes and around Michigan and um, started to wonder what other, what invasive species might be really impacting the coast of California particularly in Southern California where I was uh, stationed. So that's how I arrived at Sargassum horneri, uh, which is my study species. But before I get into the uh, gritty details about my dissertation research, I first wanted to kind of give a broad overview of what exactly are invasive species. So while many species may travel from their native range to a non-native location, Species that have no discernible impact on the environments they invade are considered to be introduced species. On the other hand, species that have a negative impact on the environments they invade are considered to be invasive species. 
Successful species invasions are one of the leading causes of biodiversity loss worldwide, uh, only second behind habitat degradation. Species invasions have accelerated over the past decade, and these invasions are a particular concern in critical ecosystems or ecosystems that provide numerous uh, benefits and services to um, sweet plants and animals as well as to humans. And an example of this is the invasion of lionfish into coral reefs pictured on the right. However, many species, while many species may travel from their native range to a non-native location, only a certain number of these species actually become invasive and successful invasive. So there are several mechanisms or um, characteristics of these invasions that make them um, actually successful in a non-native location. The first of these is competition. So uh, competition, if competition for resources such as food, space, light, nutrients, et cetera, if competition for these resources in the non-native location is very strong, then um, in the invasive species isn't able to, um, I guess, outcompete native species for these resources, then it's not likely that it'll be successful in this non-native range because competition with native species um, for these resources is very high. However, uh, disturbance or uh, any discrete event in um, a discrete change in environmental conditions that can bring about a um, distinct change in the ecosystem, um, these disturbances can be uh, things like storms, wildfires, consumer, um, popul um, I guess, rapid increases in consumer populations, um, et cetera. These disturbances can actually help to remove uh, many native species that may be holding um, many of the resources or are competitive dominant. Um, disturbance can help remove these competitive, competitive dominant native species, uh, releasing these resources that were previously unavailable for uh, invasive species to utilize. So disturbance can actually really help facilitate um, invasions. And you often see in places like um, places that have uh, frequent and intense wildfires um, that are uh, um, uh, frequently removing a lot of the competitive dominant native species, then there are a lot of invasive species in those areas. And then um, consumers preferential um, or consumer preference, um, such as, um, or consumer preference like uh, uh, consumers like predators or herbivores or omnivores, um, consumers having a preference for native species over invasive species can help facilitate invasive success. And often this can occur because consumers in the invaded range don't recognize the invasive species as a source of food, or the invasive species may have uh, defense mechanisms that um, the consumer um, is not adapted to overcome. So instead, the consumer prefers native species that it's uh, used to um, eating but um, this allows the invasive to uh, be, uh, increase in its uh, prevalence because it's not being controlled by consumers at the same rate that consumers are controlling the native species. So consumer pressure is also another um, invasion, invasion mechanism. And then finally, characteristics that are inherent to the invader, such as rapid growth or um, being able to produce a lot of offspring or being able to tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions can help an invader uh, overcome um, consumer pressure, disturbance, and competition, and allow it to be successful in an invaded range. So kind of transitioning more to um, my study's focus, um, as I mentioned, species invasions are really um, critical, are, are really um, uh, impacting uh, in critical ecosystems, and one critical ecosystem uh, are forests of giant kelp, or uh, Macrocystis pyrifera. And Macrocystis is an important foundation species because it's capable of forming these complex underwater forests, which in turn are able to support over a thousand species. Giant kelp is native to California. It requires cold nutrient rich water for survival, and it can grow up to 40 meters in length. So in its range, um, where it's able to achieve high biomass, it actually is really considered to be the competitive dominant for space and light. Um, because it's able to grow so tall and, um, it, and have like such a dense um, population. So I really consider it to be the competitive dominant areas that it's able to proliferate. However, giant kelp forests have recently become invaded by Sargassum hornerei. 
which is fondly known as the devil weed. And it's a brown alga that's native to Japan. And it arrived in Long Beach Harbor in 2003 and has since spread throughout the Southern California Bight as well as uh, into Baja, Mexico. It exhibits a wide temperature tolerance, um, particularly when compared to Macrocystis pyrifera. It can grow up to three meters in length, so not as tall as Macrocystis, but it's still capable of forming these shaded understories. And it can form these dense monocultures or um, basically um, places where that is the only species that is growing and they can be very dense. And so these monocultures are hypothesized to be outcompeting a lot of native species for space and light. Uh, so El Nino Southern Oscillation is a type of climatic disturbance um, that is characterized by higher than average sea surface temperatures and lower than average uh, nutrient levels. And these conditions are generally highly unfavorable for giant kelp. And during the last El Nino, during um, 2014, 2016, denoted by this red line here, um, a lot of the giant kelp in the region significantly declined in its abundance. And this hypothetically resulted in an increase in space resources such as space and light that were previously unavailable. And in many of these areas, we saw a rapid um, and strong increase in Sargassum horneri without much recovery from kelp. And this kind of leads to the hypothesis that perhaps the El Nino disturbance um, removed the competitive dominant giant kelp, releasing, subsequently re releasing resources that were previously unavailable and allowing Sargassum Horneri to utilize those resources and become very successful in this invaded range. Um, however, this has not been tested. So um, as a Wrigley Fellow during the winter of 2019, I sought to investigate um, these questions, the first of which is whether species interactions influence Sargassum horneri success or Macrocystis pyrifera resilience. And the first facet of this is whether established beds of Macrocystis can inhibit Sargassum horneri colonization and whether this is dependent on Sargassum horneri size. So whether certain sizes or life history stages of Sargassum are better at exploiting resources than other sizes. And then the inverse of this is whether established beds of sargassum can inhibit macrocystis colonization. So if sargassum horneri moves into an area following a disturbance, is there ever a chance of macrocystis to recolonize those areas? And so I chose to, to conduct this study at Bird Rock on Catalina Island, which is just offshore of the Wrigley Institute. And during the winter of 2019, uh, I chose three sites the first of which was a site dominated by uh, sarg adult Sargassum horneri. The second site was a site dominated by adult Macrocystis. And the third site was a site um, that was lacking algal canopy or it was bare. And this site represented my recently disturbed uh, location. And so all three of these sites were directly adjacent to each other at Bird Rock and were at least 10 meters square in area. So for my first experiment, I collected three different sizes of Sargassum horneri, a recruit juvenile and adult sage, or um, small, medium, and large, basically. And I collected these from the Sargassum horneri dominated site. And then I spun all of the individuals in a salad spinner, and this allowed me to standardize the amount of water on each, of the in, uh, each individual. And then I weighed all of the individuals, and, um, and then I transplanted all the individuals back into each of the three sites, monitor, monitored light and temperature over a period of two weeks. And following the two week period, I removed everything and then measured percent change in weight or relative growth over that time period. And then for my second experiment, I collected blade stage kelp, which is a life history stage of kelp that it only consists of one blade. And I only chose to do um, do, uh, conduct this experiment with one size of kelp because it was the smallest, uh, most vulnerable stage that was readily available during this uh, during the this uh, the period I was conducting this experiment. So, only one stage of giant kelp. Um, but I collected the kelp from the kelp forest or the kelp dominated site, spun and weighed all the individuals as the previous experiment, and then transplanted in the individuals into each of the three sites monitored light and temperature over two weeks, and then measured percent change in weight or relative growth over that two week period. And on the left is, uh, these are some uh, pictures of my experimental units. 
On the left is a picture of adult sargassum horner eye, and on the right is a picture of um, the blade stage kelp. And so my, for my first experiment, um, on the x-axis uh, is the site type, and on the y-axis is growth or percent change in weight per day. And I found that growth was significantly different among the three sites, and in general, Giant or uh, in general, sargassum grew the slowest in the algal dominated sites and highest in the bear recently disturbed site or fastest in the bear recently disturbed site. Growth is also significantly different among the three st life history stages, with growth generally being the slowest in the recruit stage and highest in uh, the adult stage. And then comparing, uh, comparing these, these growth patterns to the light levels during the experiment. Um, the x-axis is the same as the previous graph, and on the y-axis is the, are the uh, average light levels in LUX. And light was significantly different among the three sites, with light levels generally being the lowest in the algal dominated sites and highest in the bare recently disturbed sites. And this corresponds to uh, the growth patterns I saw, with growth being generally the lowest in the algal dominated sites with the lowest light levels and highest in the bare recently disturbed sites with the highest light levels. So it seems like light limitation is likely inhibiting the growth of sargassum horneri. And for my uh, giant kelp experiment, um, the um, x-axis is the same as before, and on the y-axis is growth or percent change in weight per day. And there wasn't a significant difference in growth among the three sites. And in general, uh, giant kelp lost biomass regardless of site. And it's important to compare giant kelp um, the growth of giant kelp in the bare recently disturbed site versus the growth of uh, sargassum in the same site. And you can see that giant kelp lost biomass in the site, whereas um, all three stages of sargassum grew in this bare recently disturbed site. And then comparing this growth to light levels, again, light levels during this experiment were lowest in the algal dominated sites and highest in the bare recently disturbed site. And again, this does not um, correspond with the uh, growth we saw because giant kelp lost biomass regardless of whether the sites were high, had high light levels or low light levels. And so it doesn't really seem like light limitation was explaining macrocystis biomass loss. So then this led me to question what else could, could be, what else could be controlling macrocystis biomass loss if it wasn't light limitation. And um, upon pulling out my experiment from the water, I noticed distinct bite marks on a lot of the uh, uh, macrocystis individuals that I was not noticing on the sargassum individuals. So this led me to wonder whether I was um, putting out an all-you-can-eat buffet of tasty kelp for hungry herbivores. So this led me to um, investigate a second question, which was whether herbivory preference in can enhance sargassum horneri invasion or macrocystis resilience. And I conducted this experiment at Bird Rock um, in the bear, recent, uh, bear, bear site as my previous experiment. And to investigate this, I collected 20 individuals of recruit sargassum horneri and 20 individuals of blade sage kelp. And I spun and weighed all of the individuals as my previous experiments. And then I put everything back in the field, but um, half of the individuals uh, were fully caged to prevent herbivory. And then after a period of two weeks, I removed everything and measured percent change in weight uh, or relative growth over the time period between the caged and the uncaged replicates, as well as between species. And what I found was that um, on the x-axis is my caging treatment, and on the y-axis is growth. And then the legend represents what species um, or what color each species is representing, or what, uh, what species each color is representing. And um, I found that there is a significant uh, difference in growth uh, between caging treatments, and in general, caged algae grew more than the uncaged algae. However, there was not a significant difference in this growth uh, between species. However, it is important to note that in the caged uh, treatment, sargassum horneri grew uh, much more and much faster than uh, the caged macrocystis. So it seems like that in areas where herbivory pressure is low or where herbivores are lacking, then sargassum horneri will benefit and it will be able to grow much faster than uh, macrocystis. So some conclusions, um, kind of relating it back to my uh, first hypotheses, it seems like declines in macrocystis due to disturbances, um, hypothetically resulting in an increase in open space and light, 
can increase can result in an increase in sargassum horneri. And this we found was via reduction in competition for light. And we also found that areas where herbivory pressure is low, sargassum horneri, uh, recruit sargassum horneri may greatly benefit in these areas and may be able to um, outcompete or colonize spaces faster than macrocystis. And then um, for my second hypothesis, whether declines in sargassum horneri resulting again in an increase in open space and light that uh, can result in macrocystis, we did not uh, find it, this to be true because as you remember, macrocystis lost biomass regardless of site. And this uh, potentially leads to investigating other factors controlling macrocystis such as herbivory. Um, and um, it's important to know that this, this experiment was conducted during a warm water period. And these warm water periods or warm water temperatures are generally less favorable for macrocystis than sargassum. So um, this may be another factor to explore. And then finally, some implications of this research. Um, it seems like declines in macrocystis from disturbances such as El Nino can facilitate sargassum horner eye spread. And then following the, these disturbances, macrocystis recovery may be inhibited by slower growth in sargassum horner eye, competition with sargassum horner eye, and herbivore preference for macrocystis over sargassum horner eye. And then finally, limited macrocystis recovery following these disturbances can severely impact coastal biodiversity because so many species require macrocystis for survival, and including many um, services that provide that macrocystis provides may be limited by limited macrocystis recovery. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge a variety of research support and um, a variety of funding sources, particularly the USC Wrigley Institute for um, awarding me the graduate fellowship for um, three periods, um, and it's been really instrumental in helping me uh, finish my dissertation research, and um, I just have really appreciated all of the help and the wonderful community that um, is at the Wrigley Institute, and so I'm forever thankful for the support that they've provided. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me.